want a war, you're gonna get one. Now get the gun, the trust, the magic. It's the 28th of July 1997, WWF Raw and WCW Nitro were on TV and we're going to take a look at both shows to see which one was truly the best. Nitro takes place in Charleston, West Virginia tonight while WWF present Raw's War from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The WWF are also going to present SummerSlam Heart and Soul later in the week and I will be covering that pay per view this Sunday on the channel. So if you haven't done so already, you'd be helping me and the channel out a lot by subscribing to wrestling bios and turning on your notifications. Okay, if you've got your drinks and your jam sandwich ready, let's get started with episode 94. 94? Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, let's get started with episode 94 of Reliving the War. A long recap video starts Raw off where we learn all about what happened last week. It's all about Bret Hart, the attack on Vince, and how Canadian fans are embracing the hitman. On TNT, the Nitro Girls start things off while Shivani welcomes fans to the show and we're going straight to the ring for our first match. WCW presents Vicious and Delicious vs Ric Flair and Kurt Hennig. Raw presents a Heart Foundation promo. Brett and company get in the ring and Jim Ross says there will be no disciplinary action taken against Brett for his attack on Vince last week. It wouldn't be fair to suspend Brett because that means the SummerSlam main event wouldn't happen. But Gorilla Monsoon is going to announce a new WWF commissioner next week and Brett's potential disciplinary measures will be re-evaluated. USA chants fill the arena as Brett says all you gotta do is look at OJ Simpson to realize there's no justice in America. Americans would do absolutely anything to screw others over and that's exactly what's happening to the hitman. The WWF are stacking the deck against Brett. Brett says if Sean doesn't call the match down the middle it really doesn't have much consequences for HBK. Sean will just sit at home and try to find his smile again while Brett fails to win the WWF championship. Whether the fans of America like it or not, Brett says he will find a way to win the WWF Championship and he will become a 5 time champion. Brett then says if you were going to give the USA an enema, you'd stick the hose right here in Pittsburgh PA. Brent Pullman absolutely loved this line. And finally Brett says the Patriots stuck his nose in Brett's business last week. So tonight Brett's going to make an example of this new kid on the block. Brett's going to flush the Patriot down the toilet and the next guy on Brett's hit list is The Undertaker this Sunday. So has Kurt Hennig joined the Four Horsemen? Who knows? But he teams up with Slick Rick here to take on Buff Bagwell and Scott Norton so we assume Kurt's in the group. As Norton overpowers Kurt to start the match off, Shivani says there's going to be a big announcement tonight concerning the WCW World Heavyweight title. Ric Flair gets tagged in and he does a little better than Kurt. Raking the eyes of Scott seems to be the best course of action here but Big Norton shakes it off and he performs a press slam followed by a jumping shoulder block. Buff Bagwell comes in, Flair goes down after a back body drop, Buff then hits a drop kick and the crowd pops when Kurt runs in to hit Bagwell from behind. This is the best reaction Kurt Scott since coming to WCW. Flair comes back in and he hits Buff with a knife edge chop, the two then take turns at doing some damage in the corners and Buff then finds himself locked in the figure 4. Kurt runs in to keep Norton away from Rick but a rake to the eyes forces Flair to break the hold and we then take a commercial break. We come back and Bagwell's choking Flair at the ropes, Buff then hits a power slam and then we get the usual quick tags from the heels and Flair needs to tag out. The match ends with Hennig getting the hot tag, he backdrops Norton and Bagwell while Flair stands on the apron. Six then comes down, he pulls Flair down by grabbing his trunks and exposing the nature boy's ass. 
And even though Flair gets his attention taken away from the match, Bagwell and Norton still take a loss after Kurt hits the perfect plex on both the stuff Bagwell. Sean Waltman said he got to the back and Eric Bischoff fired him on the spot for pulling down Flair's trunks. This act was nothing that we hadn't seen before, but standards and practices were coming down hard on WCW, and Bischoff told Waltman that what he'd done was effectively a breach of contract. Six said that he told Bischoff he had to put DDP over later in the broadcast, Eric had to think about it, and then Waltman was instantly rehired. It's fucking nuts. Fired and rehired on the same day. For the record, Waltman actually doesn't put DDP over later on Nitro, maybe he just remembered things wrong. Six was already in hot water for shouting profanities during that Harlem Heat match we watched a few weeks back, and it does feel like Eric was maybe trying to make an example out of Sean Waltman. Legion of Doom vs Los Bariquas on Raw, and we've got a Lex Luger promo on Nitro. Not gonna sit through the tag team match this week, there's no point, it ends with all four Bariquas getting involved, and it's ruled as a disqualification. While Los Bariquas beat up Animal inside the ring, the Godwins come down and Hawk gets taken out with a slop drop. Henry then throws a bucket of slop all over the Road Warrior, and that was it really. The Legion of Doom faced the Godwins at SummerSlam, and it's incredible how the WWF were making fans not care about the Legion of Doom. For all the good the WWF were doing around this time, there was still some bad stuff going on. On Nitro, Mean Gene Okerlund says there's been some rumours in regards to the world title and Okerlund wants to know if Luger has any idea what's going on. Lex says fuck that shit, check out the body on the total package. Lex says Hogan isn't here tonight because he's probably on some movie set. Hogan said Luger was just another plain ordinary wrestler, so Luger spoke to his plain ordinary attorneys and they found a clause in Hogan's contract. Hulk has, <laughs> get this, Hulk has mandatory title defenses every 30 days apparently. And so Lex tells Hogan that he will defend the belt next week on Nitro against the total package. Lex tells Hulk to bring a chiropractor and a masseuse to Nitro because Lex is going to slap Hogan up in the rack. And there we have it, Hogan defends the belt next week. We really don't have to wait until Sturgis this time. The commentators confirm the match afterwards, next week will be a special 3 hour episode of Nitro, and if you're wondering why we aren't at episode 100 of Reliving the War, it's because of preempted shows and the fact that the first Nitro went on the air when Raw wasn't on the USA Network. Just to confirm, every single episode of Raw Nitro so far since the beginning of the war has been covered, including the unopposed nights, so make sure you're looking out for the unopposed shows too, they're all in a playlist on the channel. Triple H vs Vader was scheduled next on Raw while Ultimo Dragon defended the TV title against Prince Ikea. Is no one else allowed to wrestle for the TV title at this point except these two guys and Steve Regal? This one ended with Ultimo Dragon completely missing a spinning wheel kick. He immediately locked in a Dragon Sleeper afterwards to win the match, so yeah, not great. We all love Ultimo Dragon, but sometimes you gotta call it how you see it. The finish was shit. Over on Raw, it's confirmed that Triple H vs Mick Foley at SummerSlam is going to be a steel cage match. Hunter's still addressing Mick as mankind and not dude love during a pre match promo. Basically, the cage is there to keep China out of the ring, seeing as she interfered in the Canadian Stampede match. Hunter makes his entrance, China waits on the outside for Vader to show up, and she doesn't notice that mankind has switched places with the cameraman inside the ring, and she's very slow to react when Hunter gets attacked. When China does get in the ring though, we see a great looking spear and she starts throwing punches. It looks like Foley made a mistake by getting in the ring, but he gets a break when China smashes her little uh yeah she uh she falls off the top turnbuckle hunter and mankind then fight in the audience the mankind character is still around it seems and keep in mind foley has to defend the tag team titles later on as dude love we've got the truth commission taking on flash funk jesse james and bob holly next on raw <laughs> that's brutal and on nitro we have a rick flair promo followed by mongo and benoit taking on uh the texas hangman Flair says it's now a fact, Kurt Hennig is one of the most elite of all time, he's a horseman. Kurt comes out and once again Hennig says he didn't say anything about becoming a horseman. Flair says Kurt's just saying this so his wife doesn't get suspicious. Benoit and Mongo then come out. 
Flair grabs one of the ringside assistants and, get this, he says there's gonna be 5 women for Kurt Hennig tonight, 5 women with Benoit and 5 women with Mongo. Flair will also have 5 ladies, so that's 20 girls for the 4 horsemen tonight in Charleston. I'd hate to see the paperwork for that kind of serious horseman business. Oh, and Mean Gene's gonna get 10 girls too, make that 30 in total. That's a royal rumble right there. Kurt says he just wants to confirm he is not a horseman. Maybe after tonight he will be, but he's still a free agent and he's not siding with Ric Flair. Although by the sounds of things, he will dabble in business a little later on. Mongo and Benoit go to the ring. They're facing the Texas Hangman tonight. Who the fuck are the Texas Hangman? I hear no one ask. They had become better known as Disorderly Conduct in WCW, where they went by the names Mean Mike and Tough Tom. Superb ring names right there, gentlemen. They'd stay in WCW right up until 2001, so fair dues, I guess. Though they'd only have three televised Nitro matches. Other guys wrestled using the Texas Hangman name, but Mike Moran was usually always part of the team. All that doesn't mean jack shit though, because one of them, I don't care enough to find out which one, but one of them tops out to the Crippler Crossface. His legs were hanging outside the ring while topping out, so Nick Patrick had to tell him to move his legs back into the ring. He moves over and then he tops out again. Brilliant. During the match, the Outsiders called in the Nitro and Scott Hall sent a message to Larry Sabisco. Apparently, the Outsiders aren't here tonight. Hall says if Larry keeps running his mouth, the bad guy will force the living legend out of retirement. Kevin Nash says he's looking forward to the Randy Savage vs Scott Steiner main event and Lex Luger is not in the same league as Hollywood Hogan. On Raw, Brockus tells us to tune into WCW Nitro very soon to see his son beat up that no good jabroni Chris Jericho. Brockus also says his favourite video game is Tekken 2 and he can't wait for Tekken 3 to get released on PlayStation. Before the commission make their way down to the ring, the Commandant says we are gonna see the most elite fighting force in the world today and the truth will hurt. Out comes Sniper, Recon, The Interrogator, Medic, Assault, Pilot, Anti-Vehicle and Engineer. You wanna know the truth about the Truth Commission? They sucked. They really sucked. The WWF just didn't need any more factions, even though these guys were brought up long before the DOA and Los Bariquas were officially introduced. And I don't care if it's Bull Buchanan and Kurgan in there, the Truth Commission was still bad. Gorilla Monsoon joins the commentary table and he confirms that a new commissioner will get announced next week on Raw. Funk, James and Holly get thanked for their hard work by jobbing out to these guys and the interrogator wins the match with a sidewalk slam. Vince then phones the lucky winner of the million dollar chance, Ryan Chaddock from New York. Vince tells Ryan that he's going to SummerSlam for his chance to win a million. Vince says Ryan and a guest can attend SummerSlam and Ryan could potentially leave the show with a lot of money. Ryan wants to know how many guests can he take to SummerSlam and Vince says just one. <laughs> Lawler calls Vince a cheapskate afterwards. We'll give you a million dollars kid, maybe, but we aren't giving up another free ticket to SummerSlam. Ah, oh, Crush vs Farouk on Raw, Alex Wright vs Chris Jericho on Nitro. Before the Raw match, the Patriot says he won't turn down Bret Hart's challenge and he won't turn down the chance to defend his country. He says, personally speaking, he doesn't like Bret Hart very much and it'll be a pleasure to do his American duty tonight in the middle of the ring. The biker Michael Likers come out first, the nation then make their way down to the ring and look who it is, Ahmed Johnson's back on Raw, the man who said biker Michael Likers in the first place. The two factions square up to each other before the match begins and Ahmed asks Farouk if he can take care of Crush tonight, but Farouk tells Ahmed to get out of the ring. This is a battle between the leaders. Well, just like the Bariquas match earlier, I'm not going to sit through this one and I apologise if some of you were heavily invested in this storyline, but no, I'm not doing it. It ends once again with the factions hitting the ring and the referee throws the match out. You may say this is no different from the NWO hitting the ring causing DQ finishes, but to their credit, WCW would at least try to book some consequences for the run-ins. That would all change of course over time, but usually the DQ finishes would feed into something else the next week or at the next pay-per-view. This stuff on Raw is just brawling for the sake of brawling and it's already gotten really old really fast. I will say this though, Ahmed Johnson pulling off a Michinoku driver was pretty sweet. It's a shame it went unnoticed.
Oh yeah, baby, yeah, hot and sticky, sagte der Reitweber, bis das Wunderkind. Oh, big Bratwurst. The Cruiserweight title's on the line in this one, and I don't know, Alex seems a bit tall to be a Cruiserweight or something. He was billed at £225 and the Cruiserweight title was supposed to be for 220s and below, but let's not worry about that, all Alex has got to do is dance and all's forgiven. Alex messes around with Jericho and he gets the better of Chris to start the match off, but a slap to the face almost makes Alex call his dad for some backup. Alex gets back inside the ropes and that fool Chris Jericho agrees to a test of strength. Alex kicks Chris and he maintains wrist control after some sweet transitions. Chris thinks he can do better, but no, Alex is a god when it comes to wrist action and Jericho gets taught a lesson. A side headlock from Alex makes Jericho panic. Y2J tries to shoot Alex into the ropes, but Jericho's hair gets tangled up in Alex's fist and Chris remains in the headlock. Wright then takes a heel kick and he decides to have a little time out. Chris gets the crowd all fired up before hitting a shoulder block that sends Alex back to the floor. Alex turns it around with a suplex on the outside and back in the ring, Alex lands a one foot stomp from the top rope. Alex lands a side suplex, he beats the shit out of Jericho in the corner, he then misses a knee drop from the top rope and this allows Chris to come back with a few corner clotheslines. We then see the lion salt but Alex rolls out to the apron where he's able to poke Jericho in the eye. Alex then gets out of a sleeper by dropping Chris over the top rope. Chris then tries to end it with a small package but Alex kicks out and we see a German suplex by an actual German. 1, 2, 3, Alex Wright wins and... wait, Alex Wright wins? Alex Wright wins? Alex is the new Cruiserweight Champion and he celebrates by dancing in front of the belt like the absolute hero he truly is. Monumental, absolutely monumental. The era of Saturday Ride Fever is upon us, ladies and gentlemen. Things will never be the same again. Not just an important night in WCW history, but an important night in the history of the whole universe. The Godwins take on Stone Cold and Dude Love next on Raw. On Nitro, we have a Double J and Dean Malenko promo and a Six vs Dallas Page match. Austin gets Henry out of the bout after a few right hands and it starts off with Mick and Phineas. Owen and Bulldog, who are providing commentary for this match, say they can't wait to get back to God's country in the near future as Dude Love hits a clothesline inside the ring. Austin gets tagged in and Bulldog says his wife could beat these guys quicker than she beats off his massive, I mean quicker than she beat the competition to become Mrs. Calgary. Henry gets tagged in and he instantly takes a clothesline. Stone Cold loses his footing a bit because he's so amped up, but Henry turns it around when Dude Love gets tagged back in. Owen says on commentary that there's absolutely no way Austin's gonna beat him at SummerSlam and then Henry comes in and some double team action keeps Foley at bay. Bulldog says he's the strongest man in the WWF not just because he lifts the heaviest weights, but he's mentally strong because he's been off the chin locks for 5 weeks. Kenny Boy Shamrock's gonna eat some dog food at SummerSlam to celebrate Davey's milestone, and tonight on Raw, Davey's gonna beat Ken in an arm wrestling competition, more on that later. Dude Love lands a bulldog and then Stone Cold comes in, absolutely cleaning house with a Luthez press on Phineas before landing body slams and clotheslines on both pig boys. We see the stunner but Austin gets sent to the outside afterwards, giving Owen Hart the chance to hit Austin with his IC championship belt. Austin then gets counted out, so the Godwins have a victory over the tag team champions. Even Dude Loves all like, I can't believe this just happened. Austin retaliates against Owen and this leads to a big old fight outside the ring. The Legion of Doom come out to help Austin and Dude Love and it ends with the heels escaping back up the ramp. Austin grabs a headset and he promises to whip Owen Hart this week at SummerSlam. The Owen vs Austin SummerSlam match was indeed memorable but not for the reasons Austin hoped for. Double J comes out with Dean Malenko and it's time for Dean to answer the question, will he be Double J's BFF? Dean says yeah, he's in. He understands it's smart to have someone watch his back and carry his bags around the airports. But he wants to know why Eddie seemingly helped Double J on WCW Saturday night and Jared says it's nothing to worry about. Eddie, like everyone else, just wanted to be around a winner like Double J. 
Deborah says she and Double J just aren't interested in guys like Eddie Guerrero, they want to team up with Dean Malenko, and Dean just pretty much agrees, so there you have it, the newest, biggest, baddest team to compete in WCW since the Texas Hangman. Mean Gene tells Double J to burn his shirt after the promo, it's good stuff. 6 then battled DDP, funny to think Sean just got fired before this match and then brought back in immediately afterwards. You wouldn't be able to tell anything happened judging by Six's entrance and his performance, he's as good as ever here. Paige gets taken down and Waltman seeks refuge in the corner afterwards. There's nowhere for Six to escape when he takes a pump handle backbreaker. Bobby Heenan says this move right here is something we wouldn't see Paige do a year ago. Paige hits a neckbreaker followed by an inverted atomic drop, a back elbow then sends Waltman to the outside, and Six is then able to come back in and he performs his corner kicks followed by the Bronco Buster. Paige replies with a discus clothesline, we see the diamond clash or the pancake, and then Vincent causes a distraction. Six tries to take advantage and lock in the buzzkill but Dallas counters with a diamond cutter. You'd think that's it all over, but Kurt Hennig shows up and Dallas gets whacked with those brass knucks that don't look like brass knucks but we call them brass knucks anyway. Six ends up winning via pinfall and the commentators wonder if Hennig is actually part of the new world order. Devin Storm vs Ace Darling on Raw, plus the Bulldog and Shamrock have that arm wrestling match. On Nitro we have Hector Guerrero vs Dean Malenko and a Conan promo. So the last time we saw Devin Storm was on WCW Nitro where he teamed up with Ace Darling. Remember the extreme? Remember the outsiders beat them a few times on Nitro? Well, here's how their story ended. Darling shows up in one more WWF match on Shotgun Saturday night, while Storm would show up again later in the year for a Raw match against Takamichi no Gu. An absolute earth shattering match here at only 44 seconds long, and look at the pinfall. Doesn't it look like Ace tried to kick out but he was being held down forcefully? Not saying that's what happened, but it's a very odd and very short match with effectively two job guys. Devin Storm then almost falls on his ass during his little celebration. Ken Shamrock came down to the ring before the match with a table. He wants to do this arm wrestling thing right now. But first, McMahon's gotta phone the next million dollar giveaway winner. His name is Patrick. This is Vince McMahon from the World Wrestling Federation. No, this is Patrick. Patrick's very excited to go to SummerSlam and he says he's watching Raw right now, good for him. Davey comes down to the ring and, in all seriousness, I can't think of anything more fucking boring than an arm wrestling competition, but I'd still rather watch this than watch the dirty old assholes vs Los Bariquas stuff. No chin locks for Davey means his arms have an incredible amount of reserve strength and it was all going well to begin with. The entertainment isn't in watching the arms or technique, it comes in watching the facial expressions. Some proper constipation faces on Raw tonight folks and also, for some reason, Ert Hebner has his hands in the air and he's waving them like he just don't care. Ken then makes a comeback and he whispers to Davey, I'll chin lock your mother. And Davey fucking loses it, he headbutts Shamrock and he takes him out with a steel chair. Shamrock gets annihilated and to add insult to injury, Davey pulls out a bumper sized can of dog food and he smears it all over Shamrock. All Davey wanted was a fair arm wrestling contest but Shamrock had to bring up chin locks. Davey is still 5 weeks clean, he has to make it through Summerslam before we can give him another point and a bronze medal. It's gonna be Davey's toughest challenge to date, no doubt, and you can see it all this Sunday at SummerSlam 97. Malenko vs Hector Guerrero featured interference from Double J and Debra, as expected. The two distracted Hector on the outside and this allowed Dean to hit a dropkick, and then he applied the Texas Cloverleaf. Chavo Guerrero then came out to check on Hector and he squared up the Double J. Malenko attacked Chavo from behind. Jared strutted in the ring and you get the feeling that Dean Malenko actually wants no part of Double J and Debra at all and he maybe has an ulterior motive. Also, it looks like Double J did not burn his shirt as suggested by Mean Gene Okerlund. Speaking of Okerlund, Conan drags him out to the stage for an interview. Conan says if your TV screen looks a bit fuzzy, if it looks a bit faded or worn out, don't adjust your set, it's only Mean Gene Okerlund. <laughs> Conan says Rey Mysterio is an establishment puppet. 
Conan brought Ray and every other luchador into WCW and starting the night, he's gonna begin taking them all out, starting with La Parca. He ends the promo by saying this. Cause ain't no party like a wolf pack party cause a wolf pack party never stops. Arriba la raza! Goldust vs Rockabilly on Raw, The Giant vs The Great Muda on Nitro. We've got some nonsense going on before Muda and Giant lock up. Randy Savage appears in the audience following The Giant's entrance and he says the madness is taking care of family business. At Road Wild, the Macho Man's gonna destroy The Giant and in tonight's main event, the Macho Man's gonna take care of Scotty Steiner. Giant says the best thing Macho can do is stay in the audience and wait for his turn at Sturgis. Macho should just pay close attention to this match. Randy then says this. I'll make you pay, just like Scotty Steiner, just dig it, yeah. This is a rematch from last week, remember Muda spread the mist on the big man on the last episode of Nitro. Muda makes his way down to the ring, the bell rings and then the NW's music plays again in the arena. Eric Bischoff shows up and he goes on commentary. He removes Mike Tanay and Bobby Heenan and he tells Tony Schiavone to stay while calling him fat boy. Bischoff rips into Giant as Muda tries his best to gain any kind of advantage. Muda rakes the eyes, he tries to keep the pressure on, but the Giant's doing what he always does, overpowering his opponent. A big slap sends Muda to the outside, he gets back in, he takes more punishment including another big slap, and Muda takes another timeout. We resume the match, Muda's single leg takedown does absolutely nothing, the Giant hits a sidekick and Muda says fuck it and he goes under the ring. He then reappears with a peekaboo on the other side of the ring. He hits a few drop kicks, but the giant won't go down. What does bring the big man down is some focused attacks to the left leg. Muda lays it in, bringing the giant down with kicks and drop kicks. He hits a top rope chop that seemingly does no damage. A top rope drop kick also fails to hurt the big man. Muda goes for one more top rope chop, but giant catches him. This leads to Muda spraying the green mist, but the giant covers his eyes. Muda gets chokeslammed and that's the match over. Giant challenges any NWO member to come down to the ring and Larry Zabisco returns to the commentary desk. He tells Bischoff to leave before the two start pushing each other and Larry ends up grabbing Eric and Easy e gets thrown into the ring. The Giant chokeslams Bischoff and this gets an incredible reaction from the crowd. The Giant walks away afterwards and you better believe there's going to be some repercussions for this attack. The match was alright, the chokeslam at the end was great. Goldust vs Rockabilly then, Rockabilly just won't disappear will he? There's a mannequin wearing a dress outside the ring and Goldust says this is what Brian Pillman will wear next week on Raw. He then drops the mic instead of passing it to Marlena and Marlena says Pillman can't fill his own tights but her male hairdresser and his friends thinks Pillman will look ripe in Marlena's dress. Alright, this one doesn't get properly underway, Goldust and Rockabilly do a little bit of work in the ring but Billy finds himself on the outside and he decides to approach IBF heavyweight champion Michael Moore who's sitting at ringside. Rockabilly slaps Michael and Michael knocks Rockabilly out. In the ring, Brian Pullman shows up, he hits Goldust with a DDT, he then destroys the mannequin and he stuffs the dress in Goldust's mouth. Marlena ends up jumping on Pillman and she tries to choke him out and officials end up hitting the ring to break things up. The Pillman and Marlena stuff would get expanded upon following Summerslam, there was way more to this than what meets the eye, but for now we'll have to wait until Summerslam to see if Pillman has to wear a dress next week on Raw. The WWF presents an Undertaker hype video next and a very brief Shawn Michaels promo, imagine that. And on Nitro, Conan takes on La Parca. La Parca's got a chair with Conan's name on it so let's see if he gets a chance to use it. Conan starts off aggressively and La Parca takes the rolling clothesline. Conan then hits a dropkick on a seated La Parca and La Parca then takes a body slam. Conan goes up top but his aerial attack gets countered with a dropkick. La Parker then lands a corkscrew attack and it's now time to use that chair and end Conan's reign of terror before it even gets started. K-Dog ends up ducking out of the way and La Parker gets the chair drop kicked in his face. We see the cradle DDT, Conan locks in the tequila sunrise and La Parka has no choice but to tap out. Psychosis comes down to stop Conan and Conan decides to leave the ring. 
After the bout, the commentary team hype up next week's WCW Nitro show. The lads are excited for Luger vs Hogan. JJ Dillon calls in and he says it's been around a year since Sting has had a match in WCW. The executive committee are working on an offer to get the Stinger back in the ring by September. Dillon wants to present this match offer to Sting next week on the special 3 hour episode of Nitro, so maybe we're going to see the icon on the next episode of Reliving the War. The Undertaker hype video features interview clips from Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart and the British Bulldog. JR provides the voiceover and he says Taker winning the title at WrestleMania has added to the Phenom's legacy. Bret says The Undertaker is a very coordinated wrestler that you can't take lightly. Shawn says The Undertaker is cool hand Luke and Shawn accepts that The Undertaker has something that he doesn't. Davy Boy praises The Undertaker's high flying abilities and how impressive it is that a big guy can move the way Taker does. And Bret echoes those sentiments, saying that The Undertaker isn't like Sid and he isn't like Diesel. The Phenom is extremely agile. Bret says the SummerSlam tagline, Heart and Soul, is perfect. These two dominated the WWF for years and it's now time to find out who's the best. HBK then comes down to the ring, all looks fine, the pyro goes off, the fans are screaming, and then Sean takes off his sunglasses and uh, yeah. It must have been buy one get one free at Painkiller Pete's candy shop because Sean looks fucking mangled. Sean says he won't apologise for what he said in Canada last week. Sean says he feels safer in the ring right now than what he does backstage. So he's gonna sit down at the commentary table and call Bret Hart's match with the Patriot. Bret can't be too happy about this. We go backstage and <laughs> yeah, Bret's throwing chairs and he's kicking innocent cardboard boxes around. Nitro ends this week with Randy Savage vs Scotty Steiner while we've got the Patriot vs Bret Hart on Raw. They added a nice touch here to Bret's entrance, he now needs a security team to bring him down to ringside. Bret confronts Vince McMahon at the commentary table and Sean's too busy vibing to Bret's theme song, this fucking guy. Bret gets in the ring and he demands the Canadian national anthem gets played before the match begins. The absolute banger of a track plays while Sean does a few lines on the commentary table. And then the Patriot comes out waving old glory and getting a good pop too. I mean, they could have sent a starting back out at this point waving the flag and he would have got a pop also. Vince McMahon says the Patriot may be out of his depth here going toe to toe with his excellency. And Vince also says the Patriot wears his mask because he's quote, the spirit and embodiment of all American citizens. Alright, the Patriot then asks for the American national anthem to get played. Brett doesn't seem too enamoured so the Patriot gets attacked during the Star Spangled Banner and the commentators highlight how disrespectful this is. Brett goes on offence and we've got some lady wearing a top hat sitting on her man's shoulders. Bobic is sitting right here and we've got Ding over here too. Brett's got great heat here though and he's fighting dirty too. The Patriot gets choked in the corner, he then gets whipped into the opposite turnbuckles and the crowd pops when Patriot gets a boot up and Brett takes a clothesline. The Patriot pops too, look he's, he fucking loves it. Brett takes a back elbow while Sean talks about, I don't know, he's talking about being a long haired earring wearing hippie. Seriously? Brett and Patriot fight on the outside for a bit and back in the ring we see a diving shoulder tackle. We go to commercial break and when we come back the Patriot takes a backbreaker followed by a side Russian leg sweep. The Patriot then takes a few headbutts to the lower back and Brett hits a great looking back suplex. Vince McMahon again says the Patriot is out of Brett's league and at this point Brett's just having fun with this jamless jerk off. Brett hits the second rope elbow drop, the Patriot tries to make a comeback in the corner, he goes for the uncle's slam, Brett tries to counter it, but the referee takes a bump. Brett hits a pile driver and he covers the Patriot, but there's no referee. He tries to pin the Patriot again but Art Hebner still hasn't come around. Shawn Michaels decides to pull Brett off the Patriot. This leads to the hitman getting distracted and the Patriot successfully pins Brett to end the main event. Who's a jammy bastard? Brett is livid. The Patriot goes back up the entranceway and the hitman wants to continue the fight. He then heads back to the ring again and he challenges HBK to step inside the ropes, but then The Undertaker shows up on the rampway and Raw fades to black. A very Nitro-esque ending to Raw this week, but still a fairly entertaining main event. Randy Savage vs Scotty Steiner is a random main event for sure, but let's check it out. 
Steiner gets the advantage and Macho decides to push Randy Anderson into Scott before throwing a wild punch. Scott gets choked on the mat but he gets up and he performs a gorilla press slam and it looked a little shaky, not gonna lie. Randy hits Rick on the outside, not a smart move. Rick ends up backing off though and Randy throws a chair into the ring, nothing comes of this. We go to commercial break and when we come back, Savage runs into Scott Steiner's boot. Randy takes a belly to belly suplex and Randy then decides to hide behind Elizabeth on the outside. When Scott tries to move Liz out of the way, he ends up taking a right hand. Macho punishes Steiner around the ring and the fight eventually spills into the audience. Savage disappears in the middle of the chaos and just like Muda earlier on, he decides to pull off a peekaboo attack by running through the stands just to appear behind Scott. That's a lot of work for a double axe handle isn't it? Savage continues to destroy Scott on the outside by throwing Scott into the ring post and laying in a few boots. Back in the ring, Savage hits a body slam and he goes upstairs. Rick keeps Macho distracted and this allows Scott to pull off an overhead belly to belly. I could watch Scott perform suplexes all day. Rick tells Liz to get off the apron while Scott backdrops Randy out of the ring and now it's Randy's turn to take a beating on the outside. The two go back into the crowd where Scott does all the damage. And when the two get back in the ropes, Randy begs for mercy but he won't get any from Steiner. A desperation low blow only stuns Scott for a moment. Randy tries to steal a victory with a small package but he ends up taking a hard clothesline for his efforts. Scott hits his release double underhook powerbomb, we see a super frankensteiner. That should be all she wrote but Liz once again jumps on the apron and Rick has to try and get her down. The outsiders then show up and they attack Rick. Scott jumps out to help and the referee throws the match out. With a 3 on 2 advantage, the outsiders and Macho Man make quick work of the Steiner brothers. Scott takes two diving elbows from the Macho Man and then the giant makes an appearance and the NWO get out of the ring. Nash, Hall and Savage laugh on their way back up the ramp. The giant grabs a mic and he says he doesn't care about Savage, he'll take care of Macho Man at Road Wild. The giant knows it was Nash who attacked him at Bash at the Beach, so Nash gets called out. Big Sexy says he isn't going to fight his way through security to get at the giant and Doug Dillinger tells the security team to back off. Old Doug wants Nash to get his ass kicked. Unfortunately, this is where Nitro ends. Kevin slowly makes his way to the ring as Tony Schiavone apologizes. Nitro goes off the air so it's another typical WCW cliffhanger. Tough choice this week but I'm giving it to Nitro. The Raw main event was ok but it wasn't great. The Nitro main event was ok too but it was ruined by the predictable finish. If we remove the main events and look at everything else this week, I think Nitro had the better matches inside the ring. Neither show was great but Nitro was just a bit better I thought. Raw has 40 points, Nitro has 42 and we've had 12 ties. In the TV ratings, Nitro scored a 3.4, Raw got a 2.9. Well, that's another one in the books. Join me this Sunday for the SummerSlam 1997 review and we'll see if The Undertaker's WWF title run comes to an end. We have also got Steve Austin vs Owen Hart at the pay per view and Davies 5 week clean streak is on the line when the Bulldog battles Ken Shamrock. The 3R 100th episode of Nitro takes place next week so we'll take a look at our number 1 before comparing the show with Monday Night Raw. Can Lex Luger win the WCW Championship? Find out in next week's episode of Reliving the War. Thanks for watching this week's show, I appreciate you guys sticking with me through this journey and I'll see you all next time. Ain't no party like a wolf pad party cuz a ain't no party like a wolf pad party cuz a ain't no party like a wolf pad 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 wolf pad wolf pad party cuz a ain't no party like a wolf pad party cuz a ain't no party like a wolf pad party cuz a ain't no party like a wolf pad party like a wolf pad party like a wolf pad party like a ain't no party like a wolf pad party cuz a ain't no party like a wolf pad party cuz a ain't no party like a wolf pad 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 party Wolf pad, wolf pad party, cause there ain't no party like a wolf pad party, cause there ain't no party like a wolf pad party, cause there ain't no party like a wolf pad party, like a wolf pad party, like a wolf pad party, like a ain't no party like a wolf pad party, cause there ain't no party like a wolf pad party, cause there ain't no party like a wolf pad party, like a wolf pad party, like a wolf pad party, like a wolf pad wolf pad pad wolf pad wolf pad pad wolf pad wolf pad pad.